Welcome to another GIA Knowledge Session, a series of talks and seminars about gemology fueled by our decades of research. I'm Evan Smith, your host for today. Yellow and orange diamonds both owe their color primarily to tiny amounts of nitrogen in their structure. Yet while yellow diamonds are among the most common fancy color diamonds, orange diamonds are among the rarest. What causes this difference in their color and the rarity between yellow and orange? Well, today we're joined by GIA senior research scientist, Dr. Mike Breeding, to talk about the atomic scale characteristics that produce the colors of these dazzling gems. Now, before we get started, a reminder that everyone in the audience is automatically muted. And if you have questions, please type them in using the Q&A feature you'll see at the bottom of the screen. There'll be a Q&A session at the end where Dr. Breeding will have a chance to answer some of your questions and we'll have a recording of this session that'll be made available for you to watch later. And with that, I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Mike Breeding. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending another GI Knowledge Session. So as Dr. Smith indicated, today I'm going to talk to you about natural yellow and orange diamonds. So what's fascinating about diamond is the range of colors that diamond occurs in. And in addition to that, many people who their only experience with diamonds are in a jewelry store may really never appreciate these colors because you really just don't see them that often. But today we're going to talk about yellow diamonds, which are the most common of the fancy colored diamonds, and perhaps the only exposure a lot of people will ever get um, to fancy colored diamonds. So the colors yellow and orange to humans are kind of special because they tend to be associated with happiness and warmth. And they're pretty remarkable in the, the diamond world as well. There's a continuum of color occurrence uh, in diamond from yellow to orange pretty much every shade in between. But what's fascinating is that diamonds that are graded yellow, just yellow, are among the most common fancy colors, whereas diamonds that are graded just orange are perhaps the rarest, which is hard to believe given how rare colors like red and blue and green are. But there just really aren't very many natural diamonds that are sort of a pure orange. So with that, I always like this slide because we know that natural diamond comes in a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. And I, although this is a staged set of stones, it really illustrates that well. I think you get the range in very small stones to very large stones. You see many are octahedra, many are resorbed dodecahedra. Then we have these larger, very irregular, often type two diamonds. But what you may not get from this image, the subtle bit of it is the color. And you, everybody sees the yellow and the, the brown, the colors. I'm not sure everyone really appreciates that nearly every diamond in here has a bit of a shade of yellow in it. And that's just how common yellow color is in diamonds. And that's because yellow color is primarily a result of nitrogen impurities in the diamond lattice. And nitrogen is one of the most abundant uh, elements in the Earth's atmosphere, even within the Earth, and so it's pretty readily incorporated into diamond during growth. It's really hard to believe that such beautiful and fascinating gems come from these large, dirty holes in the ground, these diamond mines, but it, what you really get when you look at these, and you really look down at the bottom, you see these massive, uh, large dump trucks. You get an idea of the scale and how much material has to be taken out of the earth to process to get diamonds. This is a Lomonosov mine in Russia. It's a, a mine that has fairly high production and it's, it's fairly famous for its pink diamonds, but it produces a lot of others. Um, if we look at several weeks worth of production at the Lomonosov mine, you can see in this image, the first thing that probably catches your mind is just the quantity of diamonds, but I'll point out a couple of things. A few weeks ago, I talked about very small melee diamonds, and I used the same image to illustrate just how many of the total diamonds are in these bins. They're these very tiny, tiny diamonds. There's a number of larger ones, but I think if you look at the color, what you can really see is that almost every diamond here has some shade of yellow or perhaps brownish yellow to them. Just reinforcing this notion that yellow is by far the most common color 
amongst diamond, whether that's a very pale yellow that would fall on the D to Z color grading range, or whether it uh, has enough saturation to become a fancy color. What you may not see when you look at this image, I mean, there's plenty of nice diamonds in here, jemmy, uh, bort, not jemmy stones. If you look over here in this little tiny uh, area on the left, you see a few tiny little stones. Those are the fun stones. Those are the, the higher color quality stones. So as I said, Lomonosov is famous for its pink diamonds. And of all these diamonds in these weeks of production, look at how many of the stones are actually pink. It just helps you appreciate the rarity of the colored diamonds. But amongst those diamonds that achieve fancy color that I'm showing you here, you see the vast majority are yellow. Some with a slight orangey hues to them, but almost all of them are yellow. And so this is just trying to reinforce uh, in a real life setting, this is actual diamond mine production, that what fancy colors are recovered are really extraordinary yellow and orange um, rough diamonds. I mean, you can see the very nice color saturation. All three of these stones are from South Africa. Um, What's really striking and not necessarily to scale in the photo though, is the two yellow stones recovered from the Finch mine in South Africa are 35 and 40 carats. Whereas this very, very fine orange crystal on the left is only four carats. To give you an idea of the range and size of these stones and how pretty remarkable they can be in the rough form. In 2016, uh, a very extraordinary diamond called the Arctic Sun was discovered in the Diavik mine in Canada. It's just another example of how beautiful yellow diamonds can be and also how large they can be when they're discovered. All right, so there are a number of pretty remarkable uh, orange and yellow diamonds uh, through history. And here are just a few examples. Um, the orange and the mandarin orange and the pumpkin are some of the most famous orange diamonds discovered. The pumpkin in particular is quite well known. Over the course of time, you can kind of get an idea of the values of these stones. Uh, the orange, for instance, sold for $35.5 million. It's a four, almost 15 carat diamond. The very large yellow stones as well, the Arctic sun I just showed you, the Tiffany yellow and the incomparable. Um, a lot of these values are estimated, but you get the idea. These highly saturated colors are worth a lot of money, and the diamonds are quite valuable because of their rarity. So some uh, particular regions uh, in the world, uh, diamond mines, are famous for producing yellow diamonds, and particularly sort of canary yellow diamonds. One of those is the Zimi mine in Sierra Leone on the West African Craton. It quite often produces these highly saturated yellow stones. Also, the Ellendale mine in Australia is quite famous supplier of yellow diamonds. And the diamonds there are, tend to be very nice and clean and are quite valuable in that they average about $730 per carat, which is pretty remarkable given that the quantity of diamond that's produced to have that sort of per carat value overall. But what causes yellow and orange color? I think I mentioned earlier, it's primarily related to nitrogen, but I wanna show you using a diamond lattice here, exactly how, um, how that works. So this is a pure uh, diamond with no impurities in it. So carbon atoms all lined up in a nice uh, diamond structure. If we add in some single nitrogen impurities, so substituting for the carbon, we will get nice yellow color oftentimes this canary yellow color. However, if with time and temperature in the earth, we move the nitrogen atoms around and they come next to each other, uh, we get nitrogen aggregates, pairs or groups of four with vacant spots in the middle. Well, the way that these produce color, they no longer are yellow, they're now colorless. So it's pretty remarkable in that you go from single nitrogen that's yellow to multiple nitrogens that's colorless and even more, Interestingly, if you rearrange them a bit and you put some vacant spots or you take away one of the four nitrogens, you have different defects. And these defects, once again, can produce yellow color. So the production of yellow and diamond goes from very simple to very complicated. And this is all a product of the geologic history and the growth environment and the environment in which the diamond resides over time in the earth. One of the fascinating things is that there's this whole progression 
most diamonds are thought to grow with single nitrogen impurities. So single atoms of nitrogen, which give this nice yellow color, they're called C centers. We refer to those as type 1B diamonds. However, over time, in the earth, as the stones reside in the Earth's mantle, they're under heat and pressure, and those nitrogen atoms move around and they pair up or group up into bigger groups to produce A centers or B centers or type 1AA or 1AB diamonds, which no longer produce the shell color. Those diamonds into themselves are, are colorless or near colorless. So it kind of begs the question. We know that very rarely do type 1B diamonds exist. They're a very, very tiny fraction of a percentage in all natural diamonds. So why do we have so many yellow diamonds? Well, that's because of what goes on right here in between during this transition from A centers to B centers. Part of what happens is that another defect, the N3 defect is created as the part of this transition. So you have A centers, you have B centers, and you also have N3 defects. And N3 absorbs in a way that produces very prominent yellow color in diamonds. And so that unto itself explains why most diamonds are type one, most are some combination of A and B centers, and therefore most have N3, which give rise to some shade of yellow color, depending on how much N3 they have. What's fascinating is the N3 defect also produces fluorescence, and it produces the characteristic blue fluorescence to long wave ultraviolet light that we commonly see in natural diamonds. So it kind of all fits together in a bigger picture. So why do we see color? Um, and to understand that, you have to understand selective absorption of light, and particularly visible light. Visible light is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. They combine together to, to look white, or be referred to as white light. They go into the diamond. The defects, the N3, for instance, defects in diamond, absorb certain of these wavelengths. In this case, you see they absorb the wavelengths in the blue and the violet. And the light that comes back out of the diamond then is a combination of the remaining colors, which gives you a yellow overall mixture. So this is why when you have defects like N3 in diamond, white light, part of it's absorbed, you see yellow. So hence the yellow color. This has been known for a long time. Um, it was pioneered in gemology um, by Robert Crowning Shield, the GIA. Um, a handheld spectroscope, if you're familiar with that, does shows the same thing. We have the range of the spectrum. We have dark bands of the areas that are being absorbed and the brighter areas of the transmitted areas. So these are measurements of the type of light that's being absorbed. Scientists these days for the most part use uh, UV visible absorption spectrometers, but it's the same premise. We send light in of known wavelengths. We measure what gets absorbed. And based on that, we produce these graphs or these charts where the higher value is the amount of absorption. So more absorption in the blue and the violet, the lower areas of the transmitted. So the combination of this gives rise to a yellow color. So it's all related to selective light absorption by the defects that are present. If you look at different colors of diamond and you look at visible absorption spectra, you see that they all have different defects. This red diamond absorbs at 550, the green absorbs out into the the red region as well as in the blue to give a transmission air, a low area or transmission window in the green. Here's a yellow diamond that's absorbing the blue to transmit yellow and a brown diamond that absorbs all the way across the spectrum, uh, but more so to the blue end, providing a brown color. The idea here is this different selective absorption is produced by different defects. And therefore the defects that you have control what color that you ultimately see from the diamond. Yellow has um, four major uh, defects that will produce yellow color. Um, the most common of which we refer to as cape defects. And interestingly, these are called cape defects because a lot of these yellow diamonds were found in the Cape of South, uh, excuse me, the Cape of South Africa. And they just kind of got this nickname. Most yellow diamonds are colored by these cape defects. But there are other features like H3 defects or isolated nitrogen. Uh, type 1B nitrogen that produces canary yellows, and another feature called the 480 nanometer band. My point is mainly here that you can produce yellow color through a number of different defects, and those yellows can often look quite similar. Here are the four major uh, uh, defects that will produce yellow or orange color for that matter in diamond. 
the cape defects that I talked about tend to produce paler yellow colors. Isolated nitrogen or those single nitrogen atoms tend to produce uh, deeper, sometimes canary yellow colors, but can also produce orange if there's a high enough concentration. So basically this absorption band, the more absorption you have over here, the further the band shifts and the closer you get to an orange or color. Four 80 nanometer bands are really interesting defects. We don't really know what they are. It's been speculated that they're related to oxygen and the diamond lattice, but no one's really sure. But what we are sure is that they produce orange color fairly readily. They can produce yellow, but they're most known for producing nice orange diamonds. And finally, H3 defects, which are a pair of nitrogen atoms and an empty spot of vacancy, can also produce yellow color from time to time, as well as a green overtone. Um, but that's a different story. So, but these four defects are the primary causes of yellow and orange color in natural diamonds. With each group of defects comes a range of colors that are produced. Uh, both from the concentration of the defects and also from accompanying uh, other impurities. For instance, cape defects go from a pure yellow to a pale yellow to a slight brownish hue if you start to add hydrogen to them. With isolated nitrogen, you can get a, a pure yellow. It can become more orangey with more isolated nitrogen and a few other uh, defects, or it becomes brown, more brown with plastic deformation or or uh, alteration of the rows of atoms within the diamond by shifting forces within the earth. These 480 nanometer band diamonds can go from yellow all the way to orange, depending on the concentration of the 480 nanometer band. And finally, H3 defects, depending on how much nitrogen is in them and how much corresponding green fluorescence you get. H3 is unique in that it produces yellow body color and green fluorescence. And the combination of the two will often give you a greenish overtone. But if you combine H3 with the 550 nanometer band from plastic deformation that's responsible for pink and brown diamonds, you can sometimes get brownish orange to orange colors from this as well, though this is much rarer. Uh, some of the groups also have characteristic inclusion features when viewed under magnification. You can see often oriented needles within diamonds that are colored by B centers or isolated nitrogen. They're very distinctive and often in groups. Uh, you'll also oftentimes see very distinct color zoning with these needles within the color zones where the yellow area has more isolated nitrogen than the adjacent areas. Diamonds with 480 nanometer bands, which is that defect I said we don't fully understand what is, but it seems to be associated with these sort of uh, disc-shaped inclusions quite often. Sometimes there's lots of little tiny particles in there to make up the disc, but they're very distinctive looking. And so when you see that, you can be fairly sure that you have a 480 nanometer band diamond. And finally, while cape diamonds themselves don't really have a distinctive inclusion suite, quite often they'll occur with hydrogen. And that hydrogen gives a very distinct uh, group of clouds quite often, these pattern clouds. Sometimes they become so patterned that they produce a cross appearance or something like that. But unto themselves, they're just patterned clouds and they show up very well under the microscope. If we look under diamond view or deep UV fluorescence, we see some differences between the groups as well. Cape diamonds tend to be very regular with nice octahedral growth patterns. These squares, these squares within each other where you have uh, continuous growth that's been cross cut in an octahedral form. Whereas stones with isolated nitrogen or type 1B diamonds tend to be very different. They often have an orange fluorescence that's from nitrogen vacancy defects, as well as these irregular zones, which sometimes will have H3 in them. Sometimes you'll see just very odd growth patterns in here, but they tend to be a hodgepodge of things, but they're very different than sort of the straight cape diamonds. 480 nanometer band diamonds, are quite unusual. They tend to be very irregular and very heterogeneous, oftentimes with large uh, zones like this that have inert and blue fluorescence. And then areas with sort of greenish yellow fluorescence, which is largely due to the 4A band itself. And then sometimes you even get blue, but they're very, they're like a mixture of diamond growth regimes. And it's very distinctive of these types of diamonds. And it's very fun from a scientific standpoint to try and understand the geologic history. 
And finally, H diamonds with H3 defects tend to fluoresce very strongly green. Whether that green is in a linear pattern associated with flip planes or whether it's so dominant that the entire stone fluoresces green, but it tends to be very green. So with that said, I don't, don't wanna exclude um, the D to Z color range from this discussion, even though most of what I'm talking about are, are fancy yellow and fancy orange and higher colors. But keep in mind that the whole progression from D color to Z color um, was designed, well, not designed, it was, uh, came to be simply because of increasing amounts of nitrogen impurity in diamond. Because almost all diamonds are yellow, this range is almost always to, to an increase in CAPE defects. The selective absorption increases, the higher the concentration of CAPE defects, and therefore the worse the color grade gets, so to speak, assuming that you like nice colorless diamonds as your preferred choice. Of course, once we go beyond Z, we get into the fancy colors and that's where the higher values show up. So, but this, everything I've talked about today is directly related to the D to Z color range for yellow diamonds as well. If we look at um, the yellow and orange diamonds that GI has seen over the last decade or so, we get some, start to notice some trends. If we look at the percentage of diamonds uh, relative to carat weight, it's pretty much as is expected. Every half carat or so up to two carats, there's a spike um, because these are the value fact, value points for weight, a half carat, a carat, uh, one and a half and two carats. And then after that, we start to see spikes at three carats, four carats, five carats. And then though the 10 carats itself is very small, the number of large diamonds is reasonably high accounting for almost 3% of the total, which really tells you that um, there are a lot of these large yellow diamonds out there. As far as shapes go, most are cut as cushion cuts um, with pretty much everything else being fairly similar. So I preference to cut corner rectangles, but a cushion or a rectangle cut tends to really bring out the color quite well in yellow and orange diamonds. Looking um, at the cause of color, uh, it's really interesting because this, this pie chart is actually a combination of all yellow and orange diamonds. And you see that uh, the cape related defects that I talked so much about that are responsible for D to Z color and everything, this is just fancy, mind you, but it, it accounts for almost three quarters of all of yellow, orange, and diamonds that we've seen in a decade. The others are, are fairly small with isolated nitrogen being the next most common. And notice that the 480 nanometer band occupies only about 5% of the total of all yellow and orange diamonds. This is kind of important later when I talk about oranges in general. So I'm just pointing it out now. As far as color saturation amongst color grades, it might, it's pretty much what you'd expect. Most stones that we saw are in the fancy range and it tails off to each side. Uh, pretty much evenly. More stones in the sort of vivid range. Keep in mind this lower range, the faint, very light and light is kind of skewed because generally stones in that range are, are graded on the D to Z color scale. So uh, it, it's a bit suppressed here relative to what it might be if you were grading everything in the same, same color range. So these are mostly fancy light and above. So that's why that distribution looks that way. It's, it's even more fun enough, we go and look at yellow and orange separately. And on the next couple of figures, I want to explain. When I say primary yellow, I mean that yellow is the dominant hue. So it could be a brownish yellow, a greenish yellow, could be an orangey yellow, that sort of thing. But it's not orange, it, yellow is modified by something. Whereas when I say unmodified or pure yellow, I mean just yellow. It's a fancy yellow, fancy light yellow, something like that. So for yellow, it's basically, the distribution is basically the same. Almost everything is colored by cape defects with the others fairly easily distributed, isolated nitrogen being second. Amongst the unmodified or the pure yellows, it's basically the same, a few more are capes, um, but basically the same distribution. However, when you look at orange diamonds, amongst those that are modified orange or primarily orange, it's almost a 50-50 split between isolated nitrogen and the 480 nanometer band. However, if you look at the pure or the unmodified orange colors, you see that 86% of those are colored by the 480 nanometer band. So it's really the finest, nicest, sort of purest orange diamonds 
are almost all colored by 480 nanometer bands, which is pretty amazing when you consider that we don't entirely know what that band is, but yet it's responsible for these really nice uh, unmodified orange hues. So we'll come back to oranges in particular and why why they're different in a couple slides, but I wanted to show you a couple more interesting things. When you think about color in diamond, um, it's more than just the defect that produces it. The amount of absorbance or the light absorbance that produces the color you see is related to several things. One is the path length of light. So the amount of uh, distance that the light travels through a diamond dictates how much light can be absorbed and that's therefore what you see. It's also controlled by the concentration of the defect that's responsible. So the more defect you have, generally the more color you see. And finally, by the absorption efficiency of the defect, meaning some defects will absorb light better than others. And this is an, an example that I try uh, to illustrate. You can have a very large diamond with N3 defects or Kate defects. Um, and you can have a very long path length and that diamond still end up being a pale yellow color. Whereas you can have very tiny melee sized diamonds with very short path lengths with similar amounts of nitrogen in them that produce have very strong yellow color. This is kind of counterintuitive because you'd expect shorter path lengths would equal less color. But the fact is the small diamonds tend to be colored by isolated nitrogen and isolated nitrogen is much more efficient at absorbing light than are the cape defects in general. And as a result, you can have a short path length through a very small diamond and you can still get very highly saturated colors when you have isolated nitrogen. Very rarely do larger diamonds have enough isolated nitrogen to do this. It tends not to survive in that form. It tends to aggregate in larger stones. A good question as to why this happens and scientifically we don't entirely know right now. It's a bit of a mystery, but it's pretty cool because if you have cape defects in a very tiny diamond, you won't see much if any color because the absorption efficiency of the cape defects is not enough over this path length to actually produce much color. So almost all tiny yellow diamonds are colored by isolated nitrogen, whereas almost all larger yellow diamonds are colored by cape defects. Just a fun fact to, to keep in mind. Sometimes the distribution of the color gets a little crazy and complicated too. These are a whole series of yellow to orangey yellow, um, tiny diamonds, one to two millimeters each that came from the Akati mine in Canada. And while they all look uh, decent colored, when you start to investigate where the color's coming from, what you find is that if you break them open, and yes, these are scientific samples, so we didn't mind cracking them open, you find that they're comprised of an inner core that's actually colorless and it's aggregated type 1a nitrogen. The only part that's yellow in these diamonds and going back, they look very yellow, right? The only part that's yellow is this somewhat thin at times outer rim, which represents a later stage growth of diamond in which isolated nitrogen was available. So, so you'd have grown the, the interior, it would have sat in the earth, it would have had time for the nitrogen to aggregate. And then later you would have grown a rim with isolated nitrogen in it, but that didn't have the time before the diamond erupted and came to the surface. And so it remained yellow. But this is a great example of first growth of diamond is yellow. If it sits long enough near earth, it'll turn colorless. And sometimes you get a combination of both. But these apparently yellow diamonds are actually a composite of a little bit of yellow on the outside and a whole lot of colorless on the inside. So it's kind of a, a fun example. All right, as far as orange diamonds go, I showed you a couple of defects, isolated nitrogen and the 480 nanometer band that can produce orange or yellow color, or at least these are the most common uh, abilities to do so. Well, the question is why would you get yellow on one and orange on another or vice versa? I mean, we, I've said these orange diamonds are extremely rare, so it's kind of fun to understand why they ever exist. Well, before doing that, I mean, I'll have to just extol the, the virtues of orange. Orange is a color that I mentioned is associated with warmth, but it's also associated with flavor, with spirituality, with change, the autumn season, the bringing of new things. It's so popular that um, back in the early 2000s, Halle Berry even wore this beautiful 
pumpkin diamond and a ring to the Academy Award ceremony. So th these diamonds are few and far between, but they're quite popular and the color orange is quite favorable to many people. And I mentioned earlier that it's amongst the rarest. Here I'd like to illustrate exactly how rare that is. So earlier the diagrams I showed you were all yellow and orange diamonds. So percentage it's among that. This is actually the a pie chart of the percentage among all colored diamonds, including every color. And you see that yellow dominates almost 66% of all the diamonds seen in GI over a decade or so. All the colored diamonds, excuse me, seen in GI over a decade or so. Whereas orange comprise only about two and a half percent. But these are primary hues. That means modified hues. So things that orange or yellow or these other colors are the dominant color, but not the only color. If you look amongst the pure or the unmodified hues, yellow still comprises over half of those stones, but now you really start to see how rare some of these colors are. 1.6% are green, 1% were blue, 0.06% were red, when red is generally considered to be amongst the rarest. But look, unmodified orange hues comprised only 0.03% of all the fancy color diamonds seen a GI over a decade. So you really don't see these sort of pure or unmodified orange hues very often. Really makes them rare, really makes them amazing when you do. So just like the yellowed orange I showed you earlier, uh, orange itself has a range of colors. It can go from a pure orange to more of a yellowy orange, depending on the defect responsible and how much is there. It can also skew toward a brown orange, depending on the amount of plastic deformation or other defects like H3 that are uh, accommodating it. But the holy grail of all of this, that 0.03% are these pure unmodified orange hues. So if we look at UV visible absorption spectroscopy again, you see the, the visible spectrum on the bottom. Once again, absorbance is increasing upward. For isolated nitrogen, single substitutional nitrogen, also type 1B nitrogen, all the same thing. Um, there's an absorption way out in the UV that produces this long arm. And depending on how much is there, this band extends out in absorption. So for a yellow diamond, it may come down over here. For an orange diamond, it comes further over due to higher concentrations and you get a transmission win window that's in the orange, the red region. So like I said, the color here is pretty much dependent with isolated nitrogen on how much of the defect is present. Whereas the 480 nanometer band, which I told you is responsible for most of the, the finer oranges, it's a bit different. It's also related directly to the amount of 480 necessary, uh, that's present, but the 480 doesn't vary quite as much as the isolated nitrogen does. And therefore most 480 nanometer band diamonds already absorb out to a point that they're going to have an orangey hue. And if you get just the perfect absorption so that the transmission window is exactly the right combination, you'll get these orangey hues. And this defect, as I told you, is not understood. Some have speculated that it's related to oxygen impurities in the diamond lattice, but that's really not something that's been proven. It's more of a, a theoretical approach and it's definitely open to discussion. Here's the same diagram I showed you earlier, but I want to emphasize to you before I show you the next couple slides that for pure orange hues or unmodified oranges, almost all of them are 480 nanometer band related. Whereas you can produce orange color that's modified by either isolated nitrogen or the 480 band. An additional property that you quite often see amongst orange diamonds is an interesting fluorescence pattern. So these two on the left are type 1A orange diamonds and the one on the right is a type 1B. So isolated nitrogen versus generally uh, the, this one is 480 band, this one is more H3, a little bit of 480 band. But under long wave UV, you see very different behavior. The isolated nitrogen diamond tends to be inert, tends not to fluoresce at all the long wave UV. The browner looking uh, orange diamond tends to fluoresce a greenish yellow. But if you notice the really nice, more closer to pure orange diamond fluoresces a very strong sort of red, reddish yellow to orange, orangey yellow. So more of a reddish component than a fluorescence here. 
And this is significant because it seems to indicate that it has something to do with the color itself. So it's an experiment to kind of understand why this 480 band produces these, these diamonds. You can take an orange diamond, you can select the visible absorption spectrum like this one. This is a 480 nanometer band. So similar to what I've shown you. Well, through color calculations, you can actually take the spectrum and integrate the area under the curve and you can calculate just with the spectrum alone what color you would expect to get. When you do that, you get a color that's very similar to this. And if you look, this is a little bit orangey, yellow, right? But it's not that orange. It's missing something. It's missing more of the red component. It needs more red to get from this sort of orangey yellow to this pure orange. Well, this is kind of odd because almost all pure unmodified orange diamonds have a very similar 480 nanometer brand spectrum, which should not produce a pure orange. It should produce more of this orangey yellow color. Why is that? Well, if you start to investigate, you find that another property of, of orange diamonds with 480 nanometer bands is under laser photoluminescence or producing fluorescence. So the higher the curve goes in this diamond, this is light being given off or fluorescence the more light comes off. And if you look at the wavelengths, there's always this very broad band in photoluminescence or fluorescent spectroscopy in 480 nanometer band diamonds. And that band extends from about 600 out into the infrared, meaning that it's dominated by red color. While we see to long wave UV, we see um, a bit of a sort of an orangey yellow fluorescence. When you actually look visible uh, stimulation, you will get more of a reddish fluorescence coming off of these stones. And this may very well be where the red component is that's missing from the absorption. So to get a pure orange, it's very likely that not only do we need a 480 nanometer band absorption, we also need its related fluorescence. It's a red fluorescence uh, component. Looking a bit further, the, here are, I know these are very complicated, I'm sorry, but as you go up in these three dimensional diagrams, you're increasing the amount of fluorescence that comes off. Along the, this axis, the excitation is changing, meaning the, so we have UV is at 365 long wave UV, and then at 400, we start into the visible range on to 700. And along this axis is the wavelength of light that's coming off. So you see these, these bands that you see in the center of most of these are centered between five and 600. These end up being yellowish fluorescence. But you notice in all of these 480 nanometer band orange diamonds, there's a component of this yellow fluorescence that comes into the UV. But once you get into the visible range, the excitations above 400, you see this other band that comes in. And this band is out in the red. This is what I just showed you from the photoluminescence analysis. This is the fluorescence from visible light. And so it's almost certain that the combination of this um, visible light fluorescence with the 480 nanometer absorption is why we ultimately get a, more of a pure unmodified orange hue. And you have to get the exact combination of that in order to get the hue to come out so that it's created more of an unmodified orange. That hopefully explains to you why these pure orange diamonds are so rare. It's very, very um, rare in nature to have the conditions just perfect to get this color. So in some ways, you could say that these pure orange hue diamonds are the rarest amongst the fancy colors, which is pretty amazing. It doesn't stop there. There's more fun stuff that goes on with 480 nanometer band diamonds. Um, here's one that's sort of a brownish, uh, orangey, yellow, yellowish orange stone. Here's what it looks like in normal conditions. However, if you heat it uh, very gently, you will see as you continue to heat it, the intensity of the orange color increases. And so this is a thermochromic effect, meaning that as the temperature changes, the color changes. And we can investigate why this happens. And just to note, I don't recommend you heating diamonds on your own. Um, there are many defects in diamonds that will be destroyed or permanently changed, and the color will be permanently changed if you do so. This effect, however, is temporary. 
it changes and when the heat's reduced then the stone goes back to its normal color appearance if we investigate this is a series of uh, diagrams showing the absorption spectrum for the 480 nanometer band diamond of this diamond which is here and what you see at different temperatures at room temperature the 480 nanometer band is here it lowers but it's not actually decreasing it's actually broadening with increased temperature and what's happening is as that band broadens, it actually shifts the transmission window that's producing the yellowed orange color further to the right or closer to the red and thus makes it look more orangey. So it's a direct uh, product of changing this 480 nan nanometer band temporarily to a wider state and thus pushing the transmission into the orange further. Most of this occurs between 150 and 200 degrees C which ironically um, is the same behavior that we see if you're familiar with diamonds called chameleon diamonds. These diamonds are pretty popular collector stones. They tend to be brownish, greenish, yellow, or have a green color component. And when they're heated or put in the dark for a long period of time, that color temporarily shifts to a yellow or in some cases an orangey yellow hue. What turns out the chameleon diamonds have a 480 nanometer band component in them. And as you heat them, the same type of effect is going on where you shift that band and you shift it to wavelengths that produce yellow or color and temporarily remove the green. And so it's just kind of fun to note that these pure orange diamonds have characteristics of diamonds that also change color from green to orange. So in a, a few weeks, uh, there will be a webinar where we'll talk more about color change amongst diamonds. And so hopefully you can tune into that if that's something that interests you as well. So finally, I just wanted to say that I talk about all these natural yellow and orange diamonds, but I, I wanna make sure everyone understands that not all yellow and orange diamonds are naturally colored. Not all of them are actually natural grown in the earth either. You can achieve orange or yellow colors through treatment or laboratory growth. Um, just fairly easily. So here's some examples of natural and yellow and orange, uh, grown, laboratory grown, these by the high pressure, high temperature method. Uh, these were treated by uh, radiating with an electron beam and then heating afterward to produce orange and yellow colors. And finally, some diamonds you can take and you can uh, high pressure, high temperature treat natural diamonds to produce orange or yellow colors. So keep in mind that these colors occur through the entire gambit but they're particularly spectacular when they're natural from the earth. If yellow and orange diamonds are your cup of tea, you may be interested in an article that was published in recently in the summer 2020 issue of Gems and Gemology, GIA's uh, journal. Uh, the issues and the articles are available for free online at the Gems and Gemology website under gia.edu. And if you go looking, um, I co-authored this uh, article that has a lot of what I've talked to you about here, as well as additional information. So please feel free to go have a look. I hope you've enjoyed the, this quick discussion of orange and yellow diamonds, and hopefully there'll be more of them in your future. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike. It's really incredible how these atomic scale defects make such a big difference in what we actually see at the scale of the gemstone. We've got some questions from the audience, of course. Sure. Uh, one of the first here is about nitrogen atoms in the lattice and why they have this ability to move around. Why can nitrogen atoms move around in the lattice? And are there other impurities, like I'm thinking maybe nickel, that can't move around as easily? So, yeah, there's a whole, whole uh, region of diamond physics that's devoted to understanding how impurities move in diamond. And I admittedly am not an expert, but nitrogen itself, it grows into the diamond in the place of carbon if it's present in the growth environment. But then to move around, it doesn't just uh, pluck itself from one spot to the next and swap with a carbon atom. It actually has to have something to help it. And generally, the, the notion, the prevailing notion is that either vacancies, so spots where carbon atoms are missing, which migrate very easily through diamond. You can take, for instance, if you have an empty spot and you have a carbon atom next to it, they can swap places. The carbon just pops into the empty spot. It's like a musical chair, so to speak. And if those vacancies get next to a nitrogen atom, then that nitrogen atom can 
the vacancy for a ride and switch spaces. And ultimately, if it switches enough, it'll come into contact with another nitrogen atom, and that helps it. There's also something called interstitial uh, migration, which interstitial atoms, I didn't talk about those really, but sometimes atoms aren't in their normal atomic position, they're in between. And they can be very mobile in diamond. They can move around quite easily because the energy to move from one spot to the other isn't very high. So sometimes nitrogen can hitch a ride with an interstitial, so to speak, kind of the way it does with a vacancy and move around. Other things like nickel, um, nickel is a little more complicated because the nitrogen atom is very similar in size to the carbon atom. And so it can move very fairly easily through a carbon lattice if it has a, a, a bus driver, so to speak, like those vacancies. Whereas the nickel is larger and it doesn't fit in a single carbon atom slide. It has to fit in a special arrangement where you maybe have two carbon atoms missing and a nickel in, in the middle of all of that with some vacancies or there has to be nitrogen around. So nickel doesn't migrate very easily in diamond because it can't just hop from site to site with a little assist. It would require much more energy to move it. So hopefully that explains. Right, right. I think it does. Um, okay, here's a question that I had myself and someone else asked here about uh, orange being modified by pink or red hues. Do we ever see like a pinkish orange? And if we do, what might cause that? Yeah, we do. I mean, um, the thing that gets lost in a lot of these talks is we talk about defects that are responsible for color, but in nature, it's very rare that you just have one defect. It's quite common that you'll have multiple ones. So you can get any range of color from pinkish to orange to yellow through combinations of the defects I talked about. You can also add in a 550 nanometer band defect, which is very common amongst uh, uh, diamonds that have a pink hue. This is 550 defects are not a product of growth or sitting in the earth. They're a product of the earth moving or there being differential stresses in the earth that cause the rows of atoms to actually misalign. And that's what produces 550 and, and a lot of pink color. You can get combinations there. You can get other defects like nitrogen vacancy defects, which can also generate a bit of a pink color. So yes, you can certainly get mixtures of, of pink and orange. Um, it's not particularly uncommon actually, um, but sometimes they don't necessarily get graded the way that you would think because the grading system is, is a very specialized regulated thing that's based on reference stones. So something may look pinkish, but it may end up grading more toward an orangey or a pinkish orange versus an orangey pink, that sort of thing. So that's okay. a little convoluted, I'm sorry, but hopefully you got that just a bit. Yeah, okay. There's a question here about the sort of proportions or relative rarity of different diamonds. And we talked about pure orange as being the rarest category. Um, but in that diagram, there was also a sliver for green. There was one question about how do we really know how big that green sliver is uh, if we consider this fact that it, it can be difficult to know whether green is natural or if it's been treated in some way. Do we really know the size of that green sliver? We do, and I should have qualified all that. All the data that I showed you were from diamonds that GI concluded as natural color. There's nothing included there that was concluded treated or undetermined. So anything that would have been questionable in our eyes, we would did not include in that data. So amongst natural diamonds, that's their best estimate. So okay. And what about red diamonds? Red diamonds are more abundant than orange or you, you wouldn't right? you wouldn't think so but so pure the key to this was these are diamonds graded at gi so obviously there's a grading system involved but also we're talking about pure hues whereas you don't get quite the range in uh, unmodified orange that you might get in unmodified pink but red is very similar to orange in that there's not really a whole lot of variation in terms of the saturation. It's either red or it's pink. So once you get to red, it tends to be very, very sort of systematic, uh, systematically narrow, sorry. Um, orange is the same way. So yeah, I mean, from what we've seen, the number of diamonds graded at GI over a decade, there were fewer that were graded fancy orange than there were fancy red. 
Okay. Yeah. And when we talk about these words, like something being pure orange, I mean, where do we draw the boundaries of orange? Does this come back to those reference stones? Yeah, it does. I mean, GI has a color grading system. And there have been some articles in the past in the Gems and Gemology that kind of lay out how this worked um, amongst uh, the GIA system for fancy color grading. And there are certain boundaries where within those boundaries, uh, a grade will be given to be a fancy orange or a fancy pinkish orange or yellowish orange, orangey yellow, those sorts of things. And it's all based on a series of, of reference stones that the graders compare the stones to to figure out where it falls in. And so, yeah, it's a bit arbitrary in that sense, but it's a consistent system and it's been used the GIA for many, many years and is accept, <clears throat> excuse me, accepted amongst the trade. And so therefore, um, it's a fairly decent comparison when you're trying to look at abundance. Right, right. Well, I think we might have grilled you enough, Mike. So thank you for this very informative session, Dr. Mike Breeding. It's really great. So. All right, thank you everyone for attending and uh, join, a, join in next week. So uh, Yeah, if you have any you further know. questions, uh, find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or the GIA website. And I just cut off Mike, but he was about to say that next week there'll be uh, a talk on Emerald Sources by Wim Vertriest. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye everyone.